Okay, and here we go. So, uh, hi everybody, once again. Uh, my name is uh, Angela Picciariello. I am a senior research officer in the climate and sustainability team at ODI, which is a UK-based uh, global affairs think tank. And uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome you all to this webinar on the role of the national oil companies or NOCs, as we will call them during the webinar, in renewable energy and broadly in the economic diversification of their countries. Um, so just a very quick uh, introduction of the webinar series. This webinar is the second one of a series of three webinars, which are co-hosted by the International Institute for Sustainable Development, or IISD, and the National Resource Governance Institute, or NRGI. Uh, so thank you very much to both organizations for, for arranging this and especially to my colleagues uh, Greg Mutit and Patrick Heller, as well as to Joachim Roth and Charlie Place for uh, taking care of the, the logistics of this event. Um, a little bit about the webinar series. Uh, this, uh, as I said, it's a series of three webinars. Uh, let me just move here so you can get an idea of how the three webinars uh, relate to each other. Um, the first one took place uh, around a month ago and the uh, uh, topic was the NOC's core business and how they are affected by a changing energy and climate landscape. So it focused very much on the idea of risk and how NOCs can actually tackle that in the, in the new environment. Um, and uh, that event was recorded as well. So in case uh, you missed it and you want to listen in, it's available. Uh, online. Uh, the third webinar will uh, happen in June sometime, the date is still to be confirmed, uh, but it will focus uh, specifically on the links between climate advocacy and the politics of NOCs. So watch this space for that. Um, and I will come uh, in a bit to the specific content on this webinar, but just to say that the rationale for uh, starting this series was mainly the realization that uh, there is a gap in the knowledge and probably in the debate as well when it comes to the climate change and sustainable development interaction. So um, we realized, or my colleagues at least realized uh, specifically that um, NOCs tend to have a big role, for example, when it comes to the energy investments in a lot of countries, and yet they are not uh, very much the focus of the debates around these issues. Uh, so the idea was to put the spotlight on the relevant questions, ask them in a space where there could be a debate, and also get together a number of people that come to this from different perspectives and interests. You know, you have government officials, you have NOCs officials themselves, but also climate activists and researchers and uh, think tanks uh, and a number of journalists as well, a number of other stakeholders that should speak to each other and probably don't have the forum to do so. So mm, there was a broad attempt to do that through this series. And we hope that that could happen today as well, especially uh, in the Q&A session. Um, so coming to today's webinar, um, uh, as I said, it will focus on the role that NOCs should or could have when it comes to the energy transition in their countries. Um, I think the reason why this um, came about specifically is that often um, there is an understanding that NOCs should play a role in this. And uh, uh, there is often an understanding that it's not enough for them to just divest uh, part of their uh, investments in fossil fuels uh, and just privatize that because that's not a response to the structural issues actually. So uh, the idea is that often people say, yeah, they should be the ones themselves that invest in renewables and they should drive that forward. But then can that happen? What are the trade-offs behind that is the big question. We've seen a few examples nowadays of NOCs that either have done that or have announced their intention to do that. So, you know, uh, Coal India Limited, CIL, announced uh, quite recently the development of 20 gigawatt of solar PV over the next 10 years for uh, over 700 million uh, US dollar investment. Uh, again, from India, and TPC uh, announced a target of 30% of its power plants uh, becoming renewable by 2032. 
Uh, we've seen the same in Germany through some municipal utilities that have invested in solar power and wind energy as well. We have the iconic example, of course, of Orsted, the Danish um, SOEs that have moved completely from being a fossil based to a renewable energy company. And we will hear more about that from one of our speakers today. Uh, but yeah, we want to answer two big questions, basically. Should or could NOCs help diversify their country's energy mix by starting to diversify their own business strategy and investments? And if so, do they have the mandate to do that? And what type of trade-offs would they face? And then uh, thinking a bit bigger, how would these efforts fit into the broader economic context of their own countries? And how does this change depending on the specific country's context as well? So I will not take longer time on this. I will just say something very quickly about the logistics. Uh, we have three panelists today uh, that I will introduce in a bit. Uh, each of them will speak for around seven to eight minutes, uh, and then we will open the floor for uh, two questions from, from the public. We, will like, we would like to try something hybrid, so uh, you would write your questions in the Q&A box and then I would ask you to unmute and read out your questions so that we can have a bit more of an interactive debate. So if you would already like to uh, write, type any questions while the speakers are uh, speaking, that's, uh, that's great. Uh, and uh, yeah, without further ado, let me uh, introduce to you our first distinguished panelist. Uh, Professor Joe Amuakutufu. Uh, Joe is currently the secretary to the Ghanaian government's economic management team. He has been senior advisor at the African Center for Economic Transformation and professor of economics at the San Xavier University. He has a wealth of experience as a government advisor on tax policy for uh, Ghana Ministry of Finance and Economic Planning as well. So, Joe, I would like to uh, ask you the big question to start with. How can a country like Ghana diversify its energy mix and then transition you know, its economic and productive structures from relying principally on fossil energy sources to renewables? And what kind of trade-offs would policymakers have to contend with? And finally, given the topic of this webinar, what would the role of NOCs be in such transition? So the floor is yours. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I'm happy to be part of this, actually honored to be part of this. Uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful conversation. Uh, I didn't think anybody was worried about this matter more than we were worried until the first webinar conversation. And uh, I felt that, uh, ha, um, this is a public worry for all of us. Uh, let me start from the reverse, Angela. Question, um, is there a place or a room for the national oil company in this conversation, the transition from fossil to uh, low carbon? Under our current institutional arrangement, the simple answer is no. Unless we change things. There's a space is occupied by uh, the voter River authority, not by design, where they have really gone ahead of every institution to try and print. Well, the, the explanation is that they need to supplement hydro, and therefore they are beginning to take the space for basically on solar uh, in the direction. So they are doing hydro uh, and then solar which I think is uh, no argument of that. They are in the League of Ren Renewables. Uh, the national uh, company will have to muscle its way through by virtue of probably having the capital to do so. Um, do they have the capacity to do it? Well, if you have the wallet, the capital to do it, you could probably muscle your way into it. And would they have the institutional support to do it? That's a different matter. The, to require extensive, some legislative changes, which I suspect the Water River Authority is not going to sit down either for the national oil company to invade its space. But where are we? Very simply, uh, we started this oil business, fossil fuel 
in December 2010, 10 years ago. So we are a relatively newcomer in this business. Contribution to GDP, about two, three or four percent. To national revenue, nine, ten percent contribution. Uh, that is the fossil fuels. Uh, current energy mix, hydro and thermal, powered by heavy fuel, crude, and gas. We have production fields. The current product producing fields are three. To produce, we have as a reserve close to 610 million uh, barrels of foil reserves. We also have new one, 700 coming from Acre and that is deep sea. So with this information, how can we manage the process? Should Ghana hold exploration after we've discovered 700 million, uh, million barrels of oil in our deep sea, with all the majors moving away from Ghana, our national oil company is faced with a challenge. It doesn't have the resources to continue the exploration by itself. It is always carried. And therefore the logical approach would be to convince the national oil company to change its tact. No one is gonna carry you and you can't go on this alone. So let's shift course. That will be uh, a way to confront the national oil company uh, in this, whether they be willing to refocus on renewables uh, as a national energy company. The challenge we're going to face is the Water River Authority is going to say, now this is my space. The National Oil Company, you don't fit here. Unless you're going to bring us a lot of money to do this, or unless the National Oil Company is prepared to one, reinvent itself as a national energy company, and then go into joint ventures with the private sector uh, to do this. Uh, the politicians may have to do the rest of the arithmetic uh, for us. Our problems. Ghana currently has a number of IPPs under a take or pay arrangement. In fact, there are 12 of them under take or pay. They are operating almost at 60% capacity. Therefore, we are paying for unused IPPs almost 30%. That's a huge cost for us, which means the incentive to switch away from this is indeed very high. Although we have legislation to move, into the renewables. The act was passed in 2011. Because of this huge IPP take or pay commitment, you either use it or you pay for it. And so the incentive to attract investment into renewables, let's see, the more renewables you have, the less you're going to use the IPPs and yet you have to pay for whatever they provide or don't provide the excess capacity, the idle capacity. So <laughs> the challenge for us is how do you encourage people to invest in renewables? And uh, confronted with this, um, I'm sure all policymakers will be scratching their heads. There's a huge fallout of this. We have high costs of the IPPs, we are paying very high for energy to them, although some of them have idle capacity. That means the cost of fossil fuel in our energy mix is extraordinarily high, unless we can replace them. Down the road, 
that high cost of energy means high cost of energy for industry. The non-energy sector is paying a lot. Manufacturing, all those are paying very high cost for energy. We face the risk of deindustrialization. How can you promote industrialization under this circumstance? So we are confronted with this problem. A lot of pharmaceutical companies are relocating to other places because of the cost of energy uh, in this country. And it's become a huge, huge problem uh, for us today. At the same time, a lot of the new companies coming in are pushing for more renewables because it's cheaper, because it's efficient, and because they also want the carbon credits in their home countries. If they can get the renewable here, it benefits them in a number of ways, including the carbon credit, which they can use. Yeah. So what do we do? The national oil company must face the inevitable. So the conversation is just beginning. Now, this is an inevitable game. And when it comes to the policy level, the challenge now is, can we design an incremental a transition approach? Because a lot of our productive sectors, if not all, are all fossil fuel powered. Mining, fossil fuel powered. So we have to now identify different sectors of the economy and see how to approach this without really jeopardizing the electricity corporation of Ghana, which relies on the thermal and the hydro, and they are afraid that if you bring in renewables, a lot of your high paying clients will abandon shift and go to renewables. And ECG, the Electricity Corporation, will have only poor consumers, household consumers to get revenue from. And so that is where we are. The NLC is going to be faced with the problem. There is no big oil company to carry them. If they don't have the money to continue exploration, they may have to go out there and borrow at a very high cost. That's a disincentive. They can turn to renewables at a low cost of credit. The problem we have is that the demand for us it's huge. And by my rough calculation, a national oil company cannot raise a funding to generate the equivalent of even one gigawatt of renewable energy. So we are between a rock and a hard place. We want to industrialize. The cost of energy is de-industrializing us. We have a national oil company which occupies a space which soon may be squeezed. It's gonna face institutional challenges. The private sector is pushing. And at the end of the day, the economic management team is gonna have some serious conversation. And actually we are beginning the conversation on Tuesday. We bring in all the agencies, the border river, all stakeholders into this conversation to see why can't we move on the energy, renewable energy acts and risking the industrialization. That is the challenge we are facing now. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. This was extremely inspiring, actually. And, uh, and yeah, you touched on a lot of complex issues that, you know, we, 
we were hoping actually you you would mention because they are exactly the trade-offs that we would like to to discuss later in the q a i mean the right to industrialize and how do you do that with the high cost of energy and also where are the incentives for nocs to to drive any transition if any at all which you mentioned you know there is a problem of incentives there is an economic problem as well but at the same time private actors are coming in and are pushing for renewables so how do they all interact with each other i thought this was fascinating i just forgot to mention that joe will have to leave us uh, a bit earlier in probably around 15 20 minutes time because he has to catch a last minute flight and uh, so yeah but we hope that we can have his contribution in the q a a little bit so let me move uh quite quickly to our next speaker um who is aaron sane he will help us uh, frame the discussion around some specific issues that actually already Joe touched upon, I believe. Aaron is a senior governance officer at the National Resource Governance Institute, where he helps to develop uh, the Institute's growing work on energy transitions. Uh, one particular focus for his work is the challenges and opportunities that fossil fuel rich countries face as they shift to renewables. And he's an anti-corruption lawyer by training, so he has conducted investor due diligence, market research and complex financial crimes investigation, especially in the sub-Saharan Africa. He has advised governments and companies on political risks um, and issues and he serves as an expert witness in cases of alleged wrongdoing in the oil and gas sector. So super relevant to uh, today's webinar. So Aaron, a starting question for you is, uh, should NOCs move into renewables at all? And if so, what are the trade-offs of them getting involved? How exactly are they going to get involved, if in any ways? So thank you, the floor is yours. Thank you, Angela. And, uh... Thanks very much, and many thanks to IISD also today for hosting. So, yeah, on that question, for my time, uh, I'd like to just sketch quickly some maybe key considerations that NOCs and their governments would face if the NOC wanted to get involved in renewables. Um, like Angela said, my organization, NRGI, has a line of work on the challenges that fossil fuel producers face in diversifying their domestic energy mixes. And so this question is one we've definitely been keeping an eye on. Now, everything I say here comes with the caveat that this is very much a frontier issue. Uh, you know, like many other countries, many other NOCs are, are in a similar space to the one uh, that Joe just described of, of trying to figure out what makes sense. Uh, and most NOCs, while they may be interested, they haven't really taken the plunge uh, into heavy investment in renewables yet. So a lot of what I'm gonna say will have to be speculative because there just aren't many companies we can learn lessons from yet. It's also important to say that the pros and cons of an NOC getting involved in renewables will depend partly on the role that the company wants to take. And just for clarity by renewables here, I, I mainly mean on-grid solar and wind power projects. So even though it's still early days, like I said, we see a few different models emerging out there. The first is an NOC buying shares in utility or clean tech companies, uh, you know, just as a shareholder. And you know, they can do this to diversify their holdings, to hedge against falling oil prices, to ensure their country has access to clean tech in the future, and even to take advantage of things like tax incentives. Uh, so, you know, to give you a couple of examples, China's Sinopec has been taking equity positions in solar and hydrogen tech firms, or Colombia's Ecopetrol announced not long ago that it wanted to buy shares in the big Latin American transmission firm ISA. Another model has the NOC becoming a mostly passive equity partner in renewables projects run by foreign companies. And in this case, it's the foreign company that brings most of the expertise and sometimes the capital. Good examples here would be CNOC in China and Petrobras in Brazil, both of which have recently decided to reopen offshore wind businesses that they closed earlier. In another variation on this model, you have the NOC 
overseeing renewables projects somewhat more actively, but mainly through cooperation with other state-owned enterprises. Um, a good example here would be Saudi Aramco Power, working with the Saudi Electricity Company to put up solar panels, both on its own refineries uh, and also in other parts of the country. But here, you know, the NOC's equity and operational involvement still doesn't tend to be that high. And then, you know, last but certainly not least, and we'll hear more about this later, is, is the model of transitioning to a more or less integrated energy company. Uh, you know, the gold standard, of course, being Ersted, uh, you know, but there are a few other examples, for instance, uh, Engie in France. So I'd like to suggest, uh, just to frame the discussion, that whether any of these options make sense for a particular NOC will depend a lot on the answers to three questions. And, and Joe has already touched on some of these in the context of Ghana. The first of these is, what's the NOC's mandate, both on paper and in political reality. So in particular here, NOCs that focus on collecting rents and foreign exchange from their own country's domestic fossil fuel production may find the switch to renewables tough. As demand for what they produce falls, these companies are likely to come under more and more pressure at home to produce as much as they can while they can not to start investing their already shrinking returns in a new industry that in general yields fewer rents. And the more a country's economic or political system runs on fossil fuel money, the tougher a transition may be. And NOC seeking to get into the renewable space may also face the sort of institutional tussles that Joe talked about that were going on between GNPC and, and the state utility company in Ghana. So as NOCs in this group come under pressure to decarbonize either from inside or out, they're probably more likely to stick to a sort of business as usual approach or focus on technological solutions if they have the money. So you know things like carbon capture and mitigation or cuts to gas flaring, venting, uh, you know, companies going in that direction, you know, or examples could be Petronas in Malaysia. Uh, with all of its carbon intensive gas and various of the Gulf NOCs. Or, you know, NOCs can choose to develop their less carbon intensive assets, or a few of them could focus on things like hydrogen, maybe. So, by contrast, smaller NOCs that focus more on fossil fuel imports, say, maybe like some of the ones in Asia, Latin America, or the Caribbean, they might be able to find the shift easier if they're less important to their country's economy or energy mix as things stand already. Now, the second question that an NOC and its government would have to wrestle with is, does the NOC have the capacity to adapt into a player in the renewable space? There are tons of considerations here. So, you know, for instance, does the NOC have any kind of demonstrated culture of innovation? Does it have the corporate governance systems and planning processes and culture that allow for strategic shifts? What's been its experience with other non-oil ventures? Does it have the right kinds of engineers, economists, project managers, and so on for renewable projects? And if not, can it afford to hire new ones while still taking care of its existing employees? And in the end, are there really any strong synergies between its operations and renewable? The general wisdom out there is that offshore wind is the easiest pivot for an oil company, but not many NOCs have real active experience running offshore projects. So that leads to the third question that I'm gonna suggest is important, which is what would the NOC ultimately bring to a renewables project? Would its participation add value or just headaches and challenges? There are circumstances I think we can imagine where an NOC getting involved could be an advantage. So an NOC with political clout could focus political attention on renewables. 
Maybe it could help ease some needed policy or institutional changes. Might also be able to help with politically sensitive issues like land acquisition. A really cash rich NOC could also be an alternate source of finance for a country's renewable sector. But like we've been talking about, not many are gonna fit that profile since the energy transition is actually gonna leave them with less surplus cash flow. One wild card about this third question that I'd like to introduce, and that's the sort of sub question of what about an NOC that suffers from heavy political interference in its operational and financial decisions? In some countries, we see how political pressure from vested interests can lead an NOC to make questionable and costly business decisions. This can mean inflating contract prices, using unnecessary intermediaries, uh, putting new infrastructure in places that don't really make market sense or technical sense, diverting money or other resources to politically connected actors, and so on and so on. At least in boom times, the fossil fuel sector could accommodate a fair amount of that sort of stuff. But solar and wind, maybe not so much. These are industries that tend to enjoy lower margins, fewer rents, and smaller subsidies. And in many places, already experienced companies are jockeying and trying to outbid each other to deliver power for cheaper, not to jack up prices at the state's expense. And especially in the sorts of developing countries where my organization works, things like high infrastructure costs and low consumer electricity tariffs often don't really leave much room for waste in the power supply chain. On this point, uh, there's a question that I'd like to leave hanging with us as food for thought, even though I'll admit that I don't have a settled answer to it myself not least because it would have to be a context specific. And the question is, what could inserting an NOC into a renewables project or a renewables company mean for project finance? Especially in developing countries, finance costs and the availability of finance are two of the main things that keep solar and wind projects from working. Third party lenders can be really sensitive to issues of payment risk, credit risk, governance risk, and reputational risk. So governments would do well to weigh whether inserting their NOCs into projects could conceivably make third party debt finance for those projects more expensive or even less available. I'm not saying that's necessarily the case, but it's something that needs to be considered. And I think I'll stop there and uh, look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Aaron. This was an amazing overview. And wow, I think a lot of takeaways and uh, inputs for, for discussion. I mean, from my side, I picked up specifically on you know the question of mandates, the question of incentives, are there the right incentives in place, and how actually does political pressure work with incentives? Is it a good one or a bad one, actually, completely? And uh, the question really important of the value, the added value that an, an NOC could actually bring to this or not, if actually, yeah. It creates more problems than than anything else being uh, involved in this. So I think that's that's great. I will actually uh, use some of your first inputs to <clears throat> uh, apologies uh, come to our last speaker, mm, and uh, they are the inputs about the examples of NOCs that have somehow done that, following different models. You mentioned of course, the golden standard of Oersted with respect to that. And uh, that takes us very smoothly to our uh, third and last speaker that we're very happy to have here. Uh, so let me uh, introduce you to Deva Priodas. 
Uh, Dev is a senior communications advisor at the Danish state-owned energy enterprise Orsted, where he's responsible for sustainability communications and thought leadership towards global audiences. And uh, as probably many of you already know, Orsted is uh, among the world's largest renewable energy companies uh, with a portfolio of offshore and onshore uh, wind farms, solar farms, bioenergy plants, uh, was ranked the world's uh, most sustainable energy company in the Global 100 Index by Corporate Nights. Uh, we thought it's uh, a very interesting case for us to explore because, as you probably know, it moved from being a fossil-based uh, company to a renewable, completely renewable energy company. And uh, what is also interesting, probably for the Q&A, is that Dev has previously worked as a journalist and some of his experience uh, crucially covered the oil and gas sector in Uganda as well. So we might come to that also in the, in the Q&A. Uh, but uh, yeah, let's uh, basically, let me ask you as a starting question that looking back at Orsted transition from a state-owned fossil fuel-based energy company to a renewable one, what lessons do you think could be shared for other state-owned oil and gas companies who are considering the prospect of transforming and diversifying into renewables? So the floor is yours. Take us away. Thank you, Angela. And thank you so much to the other speakers as well. Um, these are some really great points you've raised here. I think I just want to step back for one second and try and put a bit of context on this that you know, we're about um, nine years away from the 2030 target of, of halving global carbon emissions to try and have a chance to stay within one and a half degrees of uh, global warming, raising global warming. And uh, currently today about fossil fuels, the use and, and production and consumption of fossil fuels contributes 73% of carbon emissions globally. So if we don't have the energy sector stepping up to play a big role, I'm not really sure how we'll get in goal. Um, there might be different routes to reducing those emissions, but what's very clear is that all energy uh, actors have to start moving now. And also all the sectors that are reliant on energy have to start thinking about how they will they abate or remove their emissions. Um, with regards to Ulster, I think this is, we are quite a unique case in some ways because, you know, we, Ulster is a, originally a Danish company. Denmark has a very strong uh, track record in innovation in, in, in wind power, offshore wind, onshore wind. It's a company that has often been quite a leader in the green energy space and where the government has played great interest, uh, taken a great interest in supporting innovation in, in, uh, within green energy and generally within sustainability. These factors have certainly helped the transition of Erstil, which was previously known as uh, DONG, Danish Oil and Natural Gas. And uh, Dong Energy, as it was known back in the day, was actually a conglomeration of about six different energy companies which operated combined heat and power stations running on coal in Denmark. It drilled for oil and gas in the North Sea, and I should add here, had some of the lowest lifting costs in the North Sea as well. Uh, owned um, electricity distribution networks to customers in Denmark. Um, but, uh, and maybe I should also add, was at one point responsible for contributing 53% of Denmark's carbon emissions. So it was one of the most uh, carbon intense energy companies in Europe. But in a span of 10 years or so, so between roughly 2008 and well, today, uh, we've become um, one of the most innovative and sustainable energy companies in the world. And, and this has happened, uh, because I would say uh, there's been an ambition, a very strong ambition to set very high carbon reduction targets, but also have very realistic midterm targets for how to get in goal. So a bit like what uh, Joe was saying that, you know, you can have the long term, but we need to think about what we're going to do next Tuesday when we have that meeting with the uh, with the oil and gas companies. So we have to always be aware, what are you going to do next week to start uh, taking very concrete actions to cut down on your emissions and uh, transform your business? Um, we've also been very fortunate to have quite clear policy frameworks, such as those established by the EU for uh, the build out of renewable energy. Um, and at the same time, what has really helped us is, you know, we have had, uh, we, we have been helped by having a, a market outlook that kept saying, okay, there, there is potential in green energy. We need companies to fill the space. We need the companies to come with the green gigawatts. So having that visibility uh, for the long term has been very good for a company like Erstil. And that visibility usually comes with strong uh, policy and regulations. 
Um, having said that, uh, what has Ursula done that's been quite revolutionary? Well, we have through um, innovation and partnerships managed dramatically to bring down the cost of renewables and to build those renewables at scale. Um, we built the world's first offshore wind farm on a pilot basis in 1991. Um, just to give you a sense of the scale, uh, the turbines that were used uh, at the time were pretty small. Um, maybe uh, I think they were around 45. They were 45 megawatt turbines, as I remember uh, correctly. Um, uh, so, uh, sorry, excuse me. Each turbine was 0 0.45 megawatts, uh, and they had 35 meter wide uh, rotor spans. That was in 1991. Now, when we uh, have built a Horn C1 in the UK uh, that was commissioned um, last year. That has 174 turbines of seven megawatts each. Um, and the rotors are 154 meters across. And that one offshore wind farm can uh, provide green energy equivalent to uh, the needs of one million people in the UK. So uh, um, innovation and scale have really been important. At the same time, uh, what Ursula has been very good at doing is actually bringing down the cost of offshore wind. So the cost of offshore wind has fallen by 66% between 2012 and 2020. And this has largely been driven by uh, innovation in the offshore space uh, and building at scale. But building at scale also requires that you need to have the right uh, partnerships, the right partners to work with, whether it's you know suppliers, uh, the actual uh, equipment manufacturers, but also uh, what um, Aaron was hinting at towards the end of his uh, presentation that you know you need to have the right sort of financing frameworks as well. So Ursus has been quite good at figuring out how do you uh, bring investment into uh, the offshore wind space and um, how do you then have a system for farming down individual wind farms to, uh, uh, to other investors? And by doing that, you kind of recycle enough capital to invest in new renewables. And I can take a very recent example. Uh, we, uh, as a company, have been uh, the uh, first um, uh, foreign investors to be able to actually build offshore wind farms in Taiwan. Um, and uh, we were the first to actually issue a green bond in Taiwan in 2019. And um, issuing that green bond meant that we were signaling to Taiwanese investors that, hello, here we are with a project for those of you who are looking for a good, clean home for your capital. There was a lot of interest for investing sustainably in Taiwan, but not so many avenues for investment. And offshore wind provided just such an avenue. Um, a little bit about the company specifically, like what's what's happened during this transformation? Well, since 2006, because of our fundamental business model transformation, we've actually cut carbon emissions by 87%. The company will be carbon neutral in energy generation and operations by 2025, which is the, uh, the first major energy company to transform and hit carbon neutrality in this way. The uh, share of green energy in Ersted's energy production today is 90%. Um, most of the EBITDA, uh, earnings before interest uh, and tax, uh, th that comes actually, uh, more than 95% actually comes from offshore wind. So what I wanted to stress here is that the move from being a fossil fuel company to being a renewables company has actually been hugely profitable. Uh, we went from being a fairly sort of niche, you know, small Danish struggling uh, fossil fuel company to being a global, one of the largest global renewable energy players in about 12 years or 13 years. Um, we have enjoyed some advantages, such as being able to divest our oil and gas, uh, at least our, up, our upstream oil uh, operations. Um, and also uh, uh, the LNG business has been divested. Divestments will probably not be an option so much for NOCs going forward because maybe people don't want to buy those assets anymore. So timing has uh, having the having a vision to decarbonize and and go all all in for green energy has helped because it's helped us get to the front of the queue. Um, but at the same time, we've strongly uh, positioned ourselves as a renewables company and a pure play renewables company. Towards 2025, Ersted will be investing 30 billion dollars exclusively in green energy, uh, that is offshore wind, onshore wind, and solar PV. Going forward, there's also a growing pipeline in renewable hydrogen because we've realized that the next big wave of decarbonization has to be in the so-called hard to abate sectors, such as oceanic shipping, 
trucking, um, heavy industry. Uh, the professor also alluded to that. Imagine all the emissions that come from aluminum production, steel production, these can actually be electrified. And if not electrified, they can be powered with renewable hydrogen, which is made from uh, potentially at vast scale and relatively cheaply from sources such as offshore wind. So we're already looking at that next horizon. And I, I made, and I don't know if we're running out of time here, Angela, but I just want to leave you with this thought that it's, it's, it's very good that, you know, energy companies get on board this transition, but we also need to signal that, that there has to be a seriousness in this move. Um, a lot of oil and gas companies want to take a bite of the offshore wind energy pie, as Aaron was uh, was indicating. But typically, their capital expenditure so far is less than 1% in renewables. Um, they probably need to up their game if they actually want to be making a significant difference in this space. And you know, at the same time, we as a company, we know while we would really like to see more players, we'd like to we'd like to have um, more competition here because we don't want to be like the orchestra playing on the deck of the Titanic. Um, it's no good one company in Denmark uh, with, a, with a growing global presence, you know, trying to do something for the climate in as much as it has a very huge impact, outsized impact. We need all the energy players to get on board. And perhaps I think I will uh, leave you with that thought to go into the Q&A. Thank you so much, Dev. On all your presentation and your last photo on the Titanic. <laughs> I thought it was great to end. <laughs> no, I think this was amazing actually. And well, all the insights about, you know, the mix of innovation, scaling up, but also finding the right financing framework and the point that you made very strongly, which I thought was very good that in the end, it's been hugely profitable. So yeah, against a lot of the myths around this, that it's only difficulties there. So I think we will have probably time, hopefully, to, to explore a lot of this in the q and I, I would actually like to open the q and Unfortunately, uh, well, as I mentioned before, Joe had to uh, log off because he had to catch his flight. So uh, we will not have him uh, in, uh, in the Q&A, but uh, our other speakers will be here. And uh, I think there are already a few questions that have come in. As I said, it would be nice if uh, the person asking the question would like to unmute and uh, ask the question themselves so that we get a little bit of interaction and maybe just say name and affiliation if you like to. Um, I think Maria uh, Pastukova, apologies if I didn't uh, pronounce that. Angela, can you hear me? Yes, great, we can. Oh, perfect. Actually. Yes, perfect. <laughs> there you are. Uh, first of all, thanks a lot for the great presentations and uh, this very relevant webinar. Um, yeah, the, the first question we were going to draw, uh, was, was for Joe, but maybe also you or other speakers can address this because uh, what I didn't thought when, when he mentioned that it is really difficult to, to create incentives for NOCs to a shift to renewables um, was that, well, if we're thinking about the return on investments, the, the, the return on investments into the solar and wind is, is actually much quicker uh, than uh, than in oil and gas, although the upfront capital cost is higher. So isn't that allowed an incentive enough or uh, what can government maybe do? What kind of regulatory framework must be in place for NOCs to feel that this, this is uh, incentive enough? And, and the second question, or like maybe a rather comment, because I don't think anyone has an answer to this, is as you probably all have seen, this new net zero report by the IA has come out, and one of the um, crucial milestones uh, on the road where, uh, where it's the net zero 2050 was that no new uh, investments in infrastructure supplies, mainly oil and gas, are required uh, starting this year. Uh, and I was just wondering what uh, would the speakers think, what would this mean for the NOCs? And, and how could they, uh, given this known new investment in oil and gas upstream, how can they ensure a swift transition to the decarbonized future? Thank you. Thank you. Two big questions. Does any of you want to answer one or the two questions, Dev and Dar? Well, I mean, I can say on the first question that um, whether the return on investment uh, for a renew getting involved in renewables is going to give a national oil company a quicker upside than just continuing to produce and export fossil fuels. Um, that's going to depend, you know. Um, it's going to depend on 
the cost structures in the different projects. It's going to depend on the investments in infrastructure that the NRC may be called on to make or or help finance. Um, and you know there is um, and and there's also you know the cost of transforming oneself from a national oil company into a company that can have some meaningful role in renewables, uh, you know, whether those are staff costs or um, uh, you know acquiring all kinds of outside expertise or uh, I mean there are costs associated with just uh, going out into the market and trying to find finance if that's something that you have to do. So um, yeah, in the abstract, um, maybe renewables can give a quicker return. Um, but I think the question is very much like uh, compared to what and, uh, and, and what does the NOC have to do to, to get there? Yeah, maybe I could jump in there as well. Um, I, I would also take, to try to take a slightly broader perspective here that the NOCs also need to think about uh, do they want to be in a business that is dwindling and where demand is falling over time? What does that mean for them? Um, uh, would that perhaps help them to spur their diversification? I and mean, at sp some point, there will not be enough demand for their product, presumably. Uh, and then you know, they would have to think about you know, how would they diversify or, or how would they transform parts of the business to actually stay relevant? Um, to Maria's point about, you know, I, can you earn? Yes, you. the margins might be smaller, but, um, you know, an onshore or offshore wind farm, it starts earning money the moment it comes online. Um, we, we have seen examples at Ursul where a large offshore wind farm, such as the one we built in, in the Netherlands just last, uh, last year, the first turbines were actually already turning and connected to the grid, and it sounded like money, um, even before the entire offshore wind farm was built. So actually those renewables are dispatchable immediately to the grid. Um, we all even saw during the COVID-19 lockdowns that uh, you know, offshore, on, wind and solar enjoyed a bit of a boom because um, they were actually dispatched first to the grid and they did not actually suffer the same kind of uh, decline as uh, oil did particularly, but also gas. Um, in at least temporary declines. So I think that they need to think about that slightly longer term horizon. Thank you very much, Dev and Laron, for, for these answers. I think we've got um, a couple of more questions. Well, we've got a few more, but let me maybe start with uh, Dr. Abina Jindal. Uh, would you like to, to read out your question about India, I believe? Yeah. Hi, Angela. Uh, wonderful discussion we have had. And um, I just wanted to ask from people who work globally and who've been associated with so many different energy companies that what could be uh, a model NOC uh, at present, besides definitely Austed, uh, which would uh, fit in in the context of an emerging economy like India? with the kind of uh, dependence it has on fossil fuels, with the kind of uh, emissions it has at present, and also the kind of uh, uh, renewable energy targets it, uh, it has for the country, which is 450 gigawatt. I mean, do, do, uh, can our panelists help us figure out a few model NOCs which could fit in into Indian context? If yes, then, uh, I mean, how, how, what is the framework? I mean, what is the road ahead besides uh, I would also like uh, the panelists to uh, help us understand that uh, the difference in the uh, energy transition in case of Denmark vis-a-vis uh, -vis that uh, of India. I mean, definitely Denmark is a much developed and a much younger country. I mean, could we draw any parallels for the Indian transition that lies ahead? Maybe what Denmark has done in the past, could we draw some lessons for India? Thank you, Abhinav, and glad you asked that because I think, yeah, Dev and I had a very quick discussion on this point, and then I guess Aaron will have some contribution. Yeah, so maybe I could try and take that second question. Uh, and thank you, Abhinav, for the question. Well, first of all, I mean, uh, Denmark has less than 6 million people. India is now topping 1.3 billion. So I think we have to keep those uh, 
perspectives in mind. Um, one way of looking at it is, could there be an option, opportunity for at the state by state level to start thinking about, you know, green energy grids at state level, uh, because that makes it a little bit more manageable potentially. Um, but I think from a very high level, uh, the, the learnings are that government really needs to step in and set some very clear policy frameworks. You know, what are the incentives for making a transition towards green energy? I think the Indian government is already doing that to some extent, but more could be done. Could there be a liberalization also of, of, uh, of energy actors in, uh, in the energy space um, to bring more innovation uh, into the mix? Um, could it also be a question of thinking about how do we begin to um, abate emissions in some of those hard to abate sectors. And here in India, I think could play a very critical role because of the very large steel sector, for instance. Um, and then again, think about, could we somehow bring renewables uh, you know, to, closer to that discussion by, by making the primary source of, of power renewables to, to, to industry and to help industry to, to decarbonize. Um, also worth thinking about, again, from the Danish context is how do uh, governments and companies work in close collaboration to make this a fair deal uh, for workers in the energy industry so that the transition from fossil fuels to green energy is one which is quite inclusive. I mean, there are clearly a lot of skills that these energy industry workers have. Can those skills be upcycled? Can they be um, uh, re renewed in some ways so that they can instead have an impact on the renewable energy industry? Um, maybe one final thought on that is have, thinking quite holistically sustainability. Uh, Denmark has had quite a strong view on you know, environmental protections uh, and sustainability. That I think needs to be thought in hand in hand uh, in this energy transition that you know the, this green energy build out and the, um, the slow winding down of fossil fuel energy, it should happen in close concert with protection for environment. Um, about 4,500 gigawatts of green energy are expected to be brought online by 2030, um, according to Bloomberg uh, NEF. Um, and you can imagine that's a lot of steel, that's a lot of solar panels. So we need to think about how are these, uh, how is this new capacity brought online in a way that is being, you know, done in 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 balance with nature. Um, and built in a sustainable way. And I think the government needs to perhaps think about these very strong protections for environment uh, um, at the same time that they think about, you know, opening up for green energy. I, having said that, I should add though that green energy is the strongest lever we have today for reducing carbon emissions and in turn having a beneficial impact on our biodiversity and on nature. So there's no comparison between green energy and fossil fuels on, on that scale. Thank you. That's Aaron, did you want to come in on this? Yeah, I guess um, on the first question about uh, NOCs to emulate or that may be similar cases, I, I guess I just wanted to ask Dr. General a, a follow-up question. Is, is the question that, or, or the idea that um, an Indian state-owned enterprise would get involved in the renewable space, and then if it does, which uh, which foreign NOC should it draw lessons from? Is that the scenario you have in mind? Exactly, exactly. Indian Indian energy space at present is uh, dominated by state-owned enterprises. So I so we have an understanding that the Indian energy transition would be led by these state-owned enterprises at the first place. They may not be oil enterprises, but they will definitely be enterprises which will be across the energy space, coal, gas, as well as oil. So we are looking for a state-owned energy transition. Definitely, we will be looking for a model NOC, which has led that transition somewhere else. Okay. Um, I mean, if you're talking about how non-oil-focused state-owned enterprises can make the transition to renewables. To be honest with you, I, I don't know if uh, national oil companies are really your best uh, uh, sample group here. Uh, one, just because like I said at, at the start of uh, you know, my presentation earlier, uh, even the ones that are getting involved, for the most part, like it, it really is early days. And um, 
it's going to take a while to see. I mean, you know, obviously there's exceptions like, you know, Ersted who have been involved for for decades more or less and have been ramping up their involvement. But most of them, you know, they've only been in the space for a couple years, maybe slightly more. So these really are like fledgling industries. And if you're more talking about like how do you help your state-owned utilities uh, or other, you know, non-oil producing companies, uh, you know, find a model that will work for them in a peer country. I don't know that you necessarily look to NOCs. I, I think you look to state-owned utilities. Uh, you know, you look to some degree in the private sector. And, you know, maybe you start with countries that, um, that have, you know, similar industry and uh, energy and you know political climates. Yeah, maybe you look to uh, to countries like Indonesia or Malaysia. Uh, you know, Indonesia. You know, you have a bunch of small state-owned enterprises, lots of dependence on imports, cheap coal that's heavily subsidized, lots of potential for renewables. And you know, you, you see how countries like that are handling the, the issues, but not necessarily through the lens of their their oil company. Thank you both very much. And I think we can follow up with Bala, actually, who has a question that might also speak to the question by Ngozika, I think, on the refining business. Yeah, it's not limited to that. Bala, would you like to pose your question? Uh, yeah, sure. So my, my question is that the NOCs that we've discussed at least seem to rely primarily on oil extraction. Uh, my, I'm, I'm curious about companies which don't primarily do that, but rather do refining or say retail, uh, like basically selling oil and gas across the country. What do you think are some of the be better ideas for them to look into? Uh, because their, their revenue streams are not dependent on the resources, the resources itself, but like the services and the processing they do on top of that. So any sort of insightful comments or some, some other examples, it would be useful because their core skill set is not really, say for example, offshore wind because they don't really work offshore, right? So just wanted to hear the panelist thoughts on that. I can have a go. Um, so, so an SOE that focuses on refining, does it make sense for them to try a transition to renewables? Um, well, compared to SOEs that focus on production in the upstream, maybe one thing refiners have to their advantage is that unless if they're like really heavily state subsidized, they're used to operating on more of a low margin, high volume kind of business model. Um, and it might also be the case that, you know, if your, ref your refining company is used to refining oil and then selling it for export, that's one thing. Uh, but if you have a refining company that primarily serves the domestic market in different sectors, not necessarily the power sector, but, you know, other light industries and that sort of thing, then you may have a company that at least has a little bit more experience with what it means to have domestic actors as its primary customers. Um, maybe there's some advantage there. Um, and again, you know, it would de depend on what the, uh, the refining company wanted to do. Um, if it just wants to be a passive equity investor to give it more cash flow, uh, or to stay alive, that's one thing. But if it really wants to get involved in, um, in you know, managing and operating renewables projects, then a lot of the sort of questions that I raised earlier about what's its real value add, you know, would come into play because uh, I, mean, I, I can't think of that many skills um, in the refining business that are directly transferable uh, you know, to renewables and particularly state-owned refineries. Um, a lot of them do tend to survive 
on state subsidies uh, and state bailouts. And, and they may be used to a business model where um, uh, you don't have to really turn a profit. Uh, and in that case, that's, that's not a great model to start from when you're entering into a new industry that's very much about competition and profit. So um, not to be a, a, a killjoy, but those are, those are my, my first thoughts. Uh, can I add one quick point to that, Aaron? Uh, also, maybe we encourage the uh, the refiners. I mean, I'm sorry, this is really not my expertise here, but just maybe to think about who is the end customer, what is the end market that the refiner is serving, because maybe that end market itself has a need for a decarbonized solution. Let me give you an example. Ørsted recently went into a partnership with Yara of Norway and another one with BP, where the um, the idea is that eventually green electrons will begin replacing um, not so green molecules uh, in their uh, in their production of, of uh, hydrogen and ammonia. The Yara specifically ammonia, um, and this is uh, the end products. The end markets for ammonia is for uh, you know there are many of them, but especially industrial use. And there you could think that can you substitute that uh, you know uh, of fossil fuels with um, green electrons from offshore wind. And there you have a refiner, which probably has, you know, a supply chain. It has a network. Maybe they could think about how do we bring this much more, this, this purely decarbonized product out to our, our existing customers. Thank you so much, both. And Thank you. I hope your question, uh, Ngozika, was also answered partly because it was about refining. So I would move to other questions to give a bit of space to someone else because we have a few minutes left, actually. Um, maybe... Randolph is the next question I see. Would you like to, to ask your question? If you're trying to speak, we cannot hear you. I can ask the question actually. So uh, Randolph asks, some uh, new oil producers may not have NOCs, but they still have to make the transition to a cleaner energy mix. So they may need a national renewable company. What do you advise? It's a quite interesting question. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I could try and have a go at that, but I'm wondering if, if the if Randolph does he mean that do you want to do you want to set up? Is he are you asking that you would you set up a new renewables national company? So that's how I understood the question. Yeah, if you are able to unmute Randolph, <laughs> yeah, tell us. Well, I mean, I I think that's a, that could be a very bold vision and a very strong commitment from the side of the government to do that, and it probably is a far better bet than investing in a new uh, oil and gas company for sure. You will certainly have much more long term demand. And you probably have the backing of your population as well, depending uh, where you, which country you're talking about. But you know, recent surveys have also shown that more than 50% uh, of people globally polled are very concerned about climate change, and they support the move to renewables. Um, and at the same time, you know, renewables are cheaper than fossil fuels alternatives in two thirds of the world's countries. So probably, yeah, a good bet to try and do that. Yeah. I don't know. Did you want to add something? Oh boy, do I, do I get to be the cynic again? Uh, no, I, <laughs> no I, I, I'm not. I'm not going to be outright. I, I think um, no, it's it's not necessarily a bad idea. It just depends a lot on the context. Um, you know, one thing I would say, just from a financing point of view, is that a new company is going to be largely unknown to outside financiers. Uh, it's not gonna have a credit rating and a history of doing business. Um, and if the growth of your renewable sector is gonna depend on being able to access outside finance, I don't know, maybe it slows you down uh, to have a national renewables company versus um, you know, just doing more independent power projects with private actors. I, I don't know, it would depend on the space, it would depend on the market. Um, the, I guess the only other thing that I would say is that um, it would depend on the political context too, because you, you'd have to ask yourself, 
how is a national renewables company different from a state-owned utility? And if you're in a country that already has a state-owned utility, um, you um, and, and the state-owned utility, if the state-owned utility has political clout, then sort of like what Joe was talking about with the Ghanaian national company uh, and, and the state utility in Ghana, the, ut the existing utilities can say national renewables company, I don't think so. Like this is, this is our space. And then that can create political fights that slow you down. Uh, that's a possibility. Um, and then, you know, you also, um, I think sometimes, uh, you know, solutions like that, they can be a way of uh, kind of trying to make an end run around existing problems. If your state-owned utility has a lot of issues, technical or commercial challenges, or your domestic power situation has a lot of challenges, then like a new national renewables company is still gonna have to confront those same challenges in one form or another. Um, so if, it's, if, if the goal is to like leave the past behind and make something exciting and new, um, the, the past may have a way of catching up with you. Uh, but uh, uh, no, I, I don't think it's an inherently bad idea, uh, particularly if it meant that uh, it was a place for the home government to funnel more investment and, and to make real commitments to investment in renewables. Um, and if it could help bring some political attention to the issue that was otherwise lacking. But you know, it really depends on the context. Thank you so much both. It's nice actually to end on a question that was answered in a very different way from the two panelists. And, uh, and that's great, yeah. It was uh, an example of this debate, it was very rich. So I think we've reached time and I know that Dev has to go as well for family commitments. So we will uh, close it here. Uh, apologies for the questions that we didn't manage to address. It was a super interesting discussion and thanks so much once again to the two panelists, uh, to Aaron and Dev, to the organizers of this. And uh, well, uh, you can, I think in a few days, probably the recording of this will be available already online and yeah, watch this space for the next one. And any questions uh, you might have as a follow up, get in touch with, with us, with Patrick or, or Greg, you find their contacts as well on the website. So thanks so much, everybody. And have a good rest of the day. Thank you, Angela. Thanks. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Angela. Thanks. Bye. Take care.